This presentation is called, What is Biased Transmission? In this presentation, we're going to answer two questions. First, how does cultural inheritance differ from genetic inheritance? And secondly, what are three forms of biased cultural transmission? This discussion belongs within the framework of dual inheritance theory, which stresses that there are two co-evolving pathways of inheritance. One is genetic and the other is cultural. So in this presentation, we're going to be sorting out cultural from genetic transmission and then looking at some ways that cultural transmission operates. The key contributors who we've already introduced are Pete Richardson and Robert Boyd, and we're going to focus on the discussion in their book, Not by Genes Alone, How Culture Transformed Human Evolution. So culture evolves, that's the central idea in dual inheritance theory, and both genes and culture are subject to the same basic evolutionary forces. So for ordinarily we talk about genetic variation giving rise to behavioral outcomes. When we're looking at cultural evolution, we're talking about cultural variation giving rise to behavioral outcomes, which are then acted on by natural selection. So the focus of dual inheritance theory is on cultural transmission and cultural transmission differs from genetic transmission in four key ways. First, we're going to say that culture is more resourceful. And what we mean by this is that when we look at genetic transmission, there's only two sources of information. So your nuclear genetic material comes from your mother and your father, and for your mother, hers comes from her mother and father. For each of us that's produced by sexual reproduction, there's two basic sources of genetic information. But when we look at culture and ask how many sources of cultural information might influence our behavior, that's a question that depends upon how many people we interact with. And we can illustrate this very nicely through what's called the Math Genealogy Project. And the Math Genealogy Project is an excellent example of what we could call differential cultural reproductive success, resulting in cultural offspring rather than genetic offspring. On the one hand, the project lists mathematics advisors by how many PhD students worked under them. So they list all of the mathematicians with PhDs, and then they look at how many students earned their PhD working with that mathematician as their advisor. And CCJ Cool is at the top of the list with 121 PhD students. And that might not seem that impressive until we add to this frequency counts for all of the mathematicians with PhDs. And then we learn that there are 136,689 mathematicians with PhDs who have exactly zero students who've earned a PhD under them. There are 17,691 who've only had one student earn a PhD. 6,804 who've had two students earn a PhD. And from this perspective, then, CCJ Cool with 121 is a lot more productive and has a lot higher intellectual fertility rate than the great majority of mathematicians. Secondly, we're going to say that culture is more eventful. And what do we mean by this? Well, when we look at genetic transmission, there's only one transmission event, 
And that's when the sperm meets the egg and forms a new cell that's called a zygote. And all of the cells in your body descend from that one zygote. But if we look at culture and ask how many transmission events are involved, well, they're continuous over the length of our life. And again, we have to put a question mark there. It's hard to give a definitive answer. And when we look at cultural transmission in this way, we notice that culture has more pathways than genetic transmission by which it can move. So we can talk about what Richardson and Boyd call vertical cultural transmission, and that's from parent to child. So a lot of us want to be an influence on our children, and certainly our children do learn from us, but there's other cultural influences. Richardson and Boyd refer to oblique transmission when individuals who are not our parents but are in a senior position to us influence us. And an example of this might be a teacher who's not your parent but nonetheless is a key source of cultural information. And lastly, they refer to what they call horizontal cultural transmission. And this is the influence that our peers have on us. And anyone who's a parent knows that not only they will have influence on their children, but their teachers will have an influence. And certainly what we call peer pressure will matter. And peers will be a major influence. The third difference between genetic and cultural transmission is that genes and cultures change by different mechanisms. So when we look at genetic change, the ultimate source of that is mutations. And genetic mutations are quite well known. When we look at culture, the ultimate source of new culture refers to innovations in ideas and knowledge. And we don't have nearly as good an understanding of what leads to innovations as we do to what leads to mutations in DNA. The bow and arrow was a tremendously important innovation in many areas of the world. And how uh, humans in different areas were led independently to that innovation is still quite an interesting question. The fourth and final difference is that genes and cultures change at very different rates. And we can see this by simply looking at the mutation rate that occurs in our genes. So when you give birth to a child, there's probably two to three hundred new mutations in that child that weren't present in you or your partner. But if we look at the rate of mutation, given that we have 3 billion nucleotides in our DNA, the mutation rate is one mutation for every 20 to 30 million nucleotides. And that's remarkably high fidelity when we look at genetic transmission. And we know from playing the telephone game that cultural transmission isn't nearly as accurate. But quite beyond that, as we're all aware today, culture can change with tremendous speed. And one example of this is simply the rapid development of personal computers from the Apple One that was put together back in 1976 um, to the Apple II of 1984, which was a tremendous improvement over it. It had a five and a half inch floppy disk that would hold about two and a half pages of text. And you had to enter all of the HTML code to make boldface and italics and in paragraphs and all of these things. And of course, uh, computers have come uh, tremendously far from the Apple II with blinding speed. And today we're all aware of how rapidly innovation can occur. So culture is a form of learning. And to think about the kinds of learning that lead to cultural transmission, we can distinguish between trial and error learning on the one hand, and this is where as an individual you figure out what to do by, as we say, trial and error. Boyd and Richardson refer to this as guided variation, 
And that's kind of uh, obtuse language. But what they mean by this is that this can be quite adaptive. We can find out, if we're able to survive our errors, how to do things better through trial and error learning. But this is not yet culture until we share what we learn with someone else. So culture is all about social learning. And this is where, instead of figuring it out ourselves through trial and error, we simply copy and learn what other individuals have learned. And they refer to this pattern of social learning as biased transmission. And this is where cultural transmission really takes off. So cultural learning is learning from others rather than learning from your own experience. So given social learning, the big question is how do we decide what to learn? And this is based on the observation that there's all kinds of things that we can learn in the world and all kinds of people that we can learn from, particularly in large societies. And given that we only have so much time, how do we decide what we will learn and what we will ignore? And here's an excellent example of the differential survival and spread of cultural variants. This is the Korean pop star Psy, who most of you are likely familiar with. His YouTube video had 1.7 billion views so far, which is the record. And the question everybody has is, why? But quite beyond all the people viewing it, we have to look at the millions of people who then imitated the horsey dance that Psy did. And again, we have the question, why? Out of all the videos and all the dances, why was this the one chosen to imitate? And if you have an answer to that, you have fortunes to make in the entertainment industry. So there are three forms of bias transmission that Boyd and Richardson have modeled. And we say that they're biased because we're saying that not every cultural idea has an equal chance of being transmitted. Not everything that we come up with is going to be copied by someone else or learned by them. So there's a bias involved in what we learn and what we don't learn. And Boyd and Richardson argue that most cultural learning in human societies falls into three kinds of biased transmission. They call the first bias conformist bias. And this is simply doing what everyone else is doing because everyone else is doing it. So you learn the most common pattern in your group and you strive to conform. And if what they're doing turns out to be adaptive, then that's a good choice to make. You don't have to learn through trial and error. You simply do what everyone else does. The second bias they call content determined learning. And again, that's kind of an obtuse name for it. But what this is is simply learn whatever is easiest. So given the choice between putting together this four piece puzzle and figuring out this really Baroque uh, rubrics cube, the idea is that most of us will go for the four piece puzzle and will stay away from the rubrics cube. And if you doubt that, look at all the advertisements that promise you that you can learn something easily and accomplish something easily without much effort. This is the biggest uh, obstacle that higher education has today is the expectation that it should be easy and everyone should instantly be successful and no one should struggle at all. And uh, we do all seem to be very much oriented towards what's easy, except for a few twisted individuals who like to do what's hardest. And those individuals then become professors. The third bias is quite easy to understand, and Boyd and Richardson call it prestige bias. And this means that we imitate people of high status and celebrity. And certainly we can see a lot of this in all cultures and in global culture today, uh, with celebrities coming and going at a very rapid pace, and particularly for celebrities that influence our children. Um, we're often quite concerned about prestige bias.
So when you put all three of these together, these biases, we can see that they will rarely cohere. So if some individuals are doing whatever everybody else does, and others are trying to follow a prestige route, and others are trying to do what's easy, it tends to create a mix of strategies. And the question is, given that they don't fit together very well, can we really expect adaptive outcomes to result? And we're going to have to address that in a different presentation because we're out of time for this one. Thank you for listening.